All right. Welcome, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Startled you there, Tara. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the Ron Brooks Show. <laughs> We've got a, uh, I, I, you know, I'm really looking forward to today's show. You know, I've been talking about politics and politics and politics and politics and I don't know. Whoops. Now the light is in the camera. You want to face Okay. It? It's not good. Okay. No. Sorry. Um, if you can f make it face you, then it would be good, but it was facing into the camera. Uh, I'd be talking politics nonstop and I'm tired of it, sick of it. Um, so we're going to have a fun topic today, an important topic today, a foundational topic today. Uh, and with my, my good friend, uh, philosopher, uh, Tiva Smith, who's a, who is the, um, Chair of the, for Objective Studies at uh, University of Texas in Austin in the philosophy mm -hmm. there. Yeah, so welcome, Tara. It's nice to have you back. Good to be show. here. It's always good to talk to you. Thanks. So we're going to go, you know, really to the basics. And uh, we're going to talk about selfishness. And everything's really going to be framed around the topic of selfishness, all the topics today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with, with kind of what, what we mean by selfishness? Because it's such a... It's such an idea that there's so much confusion out there in the culture and in the world. Mm -hmm. um, what we mean, I think, is trying to make your life as good as it can be. I think I've lost hearing you. Could you say something? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, okay, yeah, I can. Okay. You kind of um, faded it out a little bit, so I'm not sure what it is. Okay, let me try again. Okay. okay. So selfishness, I mean, a lot of what you have to do, I think, in the case of objectivism is talk about what it's not, because people bring such baggage to it, such assumptions. And, you know, in a way, understandably, I'm not saying it's all their fault. You know, this is what they've been fed, what they get from so many different directions. But we have to distinguish it from a lot of other things. But essentially, just to, to you know, put it in more positive terms for a second, Selfishness, it's about trying to make your life as good as it can be. Because you only get so many years. You know, if you're lucky, you get a lot of years, you know, but whatever it is, it's finite. Yep. And it's not here forever. And it seems to make sense for people to want to have the best lives they have, they can have, the most rewarding lives, the happiest lives they can have, right? So to do that, you need to really think about what are going to be the pieces the components, what do I need to do? You know, on an ongoing basis, on an occasional basis, whatever, in order to compose for myself the kind of life that can keep me going, that's sustainable. You know, we love to talk about sustainable energy. What's sustainable happiness, sustainable success and satisfaction? And again, then, you know, from the more alternative point of view, we need to distinguish it from, and I can just sort of go through a whole roster and we can talk about some of these if you want. Egoism is not the same as hedonism. It's not just pleasure pursuit. It's not emotionalism. Just do whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like it. Um, it's not materialism, though self-interest certainly is partially material and importantly material, but it's not just material goods that one needs to be selfish. It's not oblivious to other people or solipsistic or non-objective in the way it treats other people. Uh, we could go on and on, so. Yeah, so let's take some of those. I mean, so why yeah. isn't it subjective, right? I mean, I, I'm unique, you're unique, every human being's unique. Why, is, why, is, why yeah. are there principles? Why isn't it just whatever's good for you is good for you, whatever's good for me is good for me? And in what, in what sense is that right and what sense is that Wrong. Yeah, no, there's a sense in which, or at least to some extent, you could understand people thinking, well, look, you know, your own has a lot of different circumstances and tastes than Tara does, than Tom, Dick, Harry does, and so on. Of course, there are differences and differences between individuals that make a difference. But at the same time, there are similarities that are not a matter of our choosing. You know, as human beings, as opposed to snails or pecan trees or whatever the hell other kind of life we might talk about, right? As human beings, there are certain commonalities that aren't a matter of taste, aren't a matter of where you grew up or when you grew up or whether you're a man or a woman or what have you, right? So it's in our nature that we have certain needs 
and that we need to do certain things in order to satisfy those. So there's a sameness about what is in our interest at the same time that there's room for some variations about particular ways of getting the food we need, the nutrients, the proteins. I mean, there are a variety of different diets that are perfectly healthy and a variety of different diets that are not healthy at all, right? But even if what's healthy for me is a little bit different, you know, is a little bit or in certain respects different from what's healthy for you, because let's say I'm hypoglycemic or something and you're not, right? Yep. There's still such a thing as what is health? Right? What is physical well-being, even if you have certain allergies and I don't have them, right? Um, there's such a thing as you know, different shoes fit different people. Yeah, I'm a size eight, my sister's a size nine, right? Doesn't mean there's not such a thing as fitting. So different things make different people happy. Well, to some extent, doesn't mean there's no such thing as happiness, that it's just subjective, matter of taste, you make it up, you know, whatever you like. There, you can be wrong about. Yeah, I, I can go on forever. You can be wrong about what's good for you. Right? We make mistakes. I'm going to invest money in that sure bet. Right? I got the advice from your own. He knows what he's talking about. He's like, but sometimes the sure bet turns out to be not so sure. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, we, know how, we know how complicated it is even to get the food right. Right? Even to get a diet, what is healthy, what is not. What is, yeah. And here we're talking about a realm which is far more complex even than the biological realm. So yeah, yeah get it no, wrong. I think you make a good point because you know we're not omniscient. We the best, smartest people sometimes make mistakes. You know they're always coming out with or they're frequently coming out with studies that show oh that thing we were telling you to do for your health, be it the diet or this practice that. Gee, damn, we made a mistake. It might have been a you know an honest mistake, a well an understandable mistake, but we got it wrong. And you're quite right in saying, now when you're talking about your whole life, you know, yeah. self-interest, I'm seeking happiness, I'm trying to make my life as good as it can be, the best it can be. That encompasses everything. Every, not just my diet or my exercise regimen, my work, my money, my friends, my time, how I spend all the hours in the day and so on. So it's orchestrating all of that, which means you really need to give it a lot of serious, serious thought. Yeah, so, you know, what is common to, to everybody? And so what are the principles that, that dictate a, a, a selfish life that, that would be universal, that would be true for, for all human beings? And how do we come at those? How do we, how would, how do we no. use those? Um, how do we... I'm sorry. How do we come to them? How do we? Oh, how do we yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of this is really material that Ayn Rand explains in the, the sort of foundations of ethics and you know, her essay on the objectivist ethics and just asking about why be moral in the first place, why have values in the first place, where they come, where they come from, those things that are objectively valuable for all human beings in principle across the board, wherever you live, whenever you live, right? Those do come most fundamentally from our nature as human beings, our needs. So we have physical needs, but in order to meet our physical needs for certain nutrition and certain exercise and hygiene and all that stuff, right? We need to use our minds. We are volitional beings whose actions depend on our thoughts. And our mind is this faculty that we can use or not, depending on how we choose or what we choose. So we need to figure out what principles of the use of the mind, of thinking, can help us to answer the kinds of questions to meet the needs that we have. So she emphasizes above all else reason, using the rational faculty, using logic, so that you can figure out what's what, spot the evidence, identify the evidence, trace logical connections to see relationships between what will serve needs and so on. So she talks, you know, reason is the kind of master virtue as I sometimes put it when I talk about the virtues. But just, I mean, again, to give you some quick, some quick answers and then we can come back to any of this if you like. You know, the, the fundamental virtues Rand thinks underneath or as aspects of being rational are being honest, being just, being productive, Proud, developing the virtue of pride as opposed to modesty or humility. Um, independence, 
integrity. These are chief virtues and major values that are the same in principle for everyone are again, reason, purpose, purpose in life, a meaning in life, self-esteem, having a certain view of oneself such that you are driven to accomplish and serve your well-being and meet those needs that you have. So again, we can pick up on, you know, I don't know if that's the kind of thing you're interested in. Or... Yeah. Um... I, I've got a, I've got a few questions here that people are, are, are sending in. So I mean, they're related to the topic. So you know, I hope so. That smiles a little <laughs> disarming. Sometimes, even when pursuing rational choices, values, he says, I run into long periods filled with obstacles. How can I avoid or overcome feeling discouraged? Well, that's a. <laughs> I feel like Dr. Fraser Crane. Um, that's a good question. And it's a very natural question that I think everybody can relate to, to different extents, you know, whatever the losing streak you're on. Um, I've been on losing streaks. I've been on periods where every goddamn article I'm sending to journals just keeps get, getting rejected or that same art. I mean, and really there's some, you know, sometimes there are real periods where it's very natural to get discouraged. So, and there's a sense in which, hey, if you, Feel the discouragement, feel the damn, this, this is lousy. This isn't going the way I want it to go or maybe I thought it would go. In terms of what you can do in cases like that, a couple of things. I mean, one is simply check what you've been doing to make sure you haven't maybe made some mistakes that are contributing to what seems like a streak of bad luck when maybe it's not just luck. Maybe, maybe there's something you should be doing differently. Now, maybe not. You have to be very honest about this and careful. The point isn't, oh, I must be doing something wrong because you know me, I'm always screwing up. Um, but nor is it, I must have done everything absolutely perfectly right because I have the right philosophy, right? So, you know, so you've got to be really honest about, are you maybe contributing? Are there changes, little things, bigger things you can switch up um, to maybe have, have better success? But the other thing is you have to, again, you have to feel whatever disappointments you feel, but you also have to keep the full picture of what goes on, what contributes to different kinds of successes and failures that one has in life. And a lot of the goals that we have are ambitious and involve other people and might require the collaboration or cooperation or good judgment of other people, which you don't always get. And you have to accept the parts that you can control and the parts you can't. I mean, that's, that's really important in life. And we all struggle with that, I think, to different extents, said the control freak. Um, but you know, you've got to keep that big picture of well, what's going well, even when certain important pockets of life might not be going so well. What can you control? Um, and, it, and it's a, I think there's also an issue of a certain confidence in, okay, if I do things right, then, you know, overwhelmingly things do work out. So yes. They do, yeah. yeah. This has happened to me before. And I remember when I struggled and I remember, yeah. when I but, you know, things do work out for the most part. There's no guarantee. Yeah. But, and, if, yeah. and if you stay steady with the effort, with making the kind of effort that really seems most appropriate to make, right? I mean, control the parts that you control as well as you can, you know, as thoughtfully, as effectively, but yeah, keeping that reminder of, oh, but I had an experience like this before, and maybe it wasn't exactly similar, but oh yeah, remember that frustration you, run in, you ran into a while ago about this, but then it was okay, you know. Um, yeah, you can talk to other friends too if they're in somewhat similar circumstances or have been about how they deal with that kind of thing. But so I sympathize for sure. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit, and it's related a little bit to this question about the role of emotions in the context of being selfish. What, what, because mm -hmm. you said you shouldn't be an emotionalist. Why? I mean, it feels good. And, and the same, you know, you Sometimes. related to the issue of hedonism. And, yeah. Uh, on the one hand, we say, you know, don't be an emotionalist. On the other hand, we're pretty emotional people and the two of us. And, uh, you know, we're, we're passionate and emotions incredibly important to happiness and, and to mm, success. Yeah. So, 
So what's yeah. the right attitude towards emotions? Well, yeah, emotions are, and, and I mean, what's crucial, you know, and what I said and what objectivism holds is don't be an emotionalist. Don't use emotions as your standards for making decisions, for trying to understand whether something is true or false or right or wrong. Emotion is not the standard, but to say that it's not the standard doesn't mean it's useless, get rid of it, cut it out of your life, minimize it, repress it. Not, excuse me, not by any means. I mean, I can get so damn emotional about this. Emotions are, they're fun. They're, I mean, that, it's, that's life feeling good. Even at the very beginning when we were talking about, you want the best life you can have. You want a happy life, a fulfilling life. Because it feels good. I mean, in large part, because yeah, that's an agreeable way to live. And emotions are, you know, they're, they're the natural corollaries or sort of uh, companions to all of the ups and downs in life. And it makes sense to feel them. The fun is in emotions, but the mistake is in treating an emotion as if that could really tell you what's right or what's wrong. Let me just try to come up with a quick example. I, you know, I had this positive, warm and fuzzy emotion about this guy, you know, who maybe we're considering hiring or something, you know, or giving a good position at school or something. And you've got some really warm and fuzzy emotions toward this guy and all, but you've got to think about, you know, so to not make the decision on an emotionalist basis, you've got to think about, is he really, let's say, the best man for the job? You know, let's think through all the kinds of qualities that we need for somebody in this position and what it is exactly that I like about him, what it is I'm responding to that's giving me that warm and fuzzy or whatever, that nice sense of camaraderie with this guy. Are those the things that are most relevant to the kind of qualities we need, the kind of experience that we need, the kind of chemistry that the whole team is going to need with him and so on? So it, it's really a matter of, what you use as your bottom line basis for making decisions, judging things. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about, you know, which is related to this, about what are objective values and what are kind of personal values. You mentioned this before. I mean, we're different. So different things are going to excite us, but there are such things as objective values. So talk a little bit about what are objective values um, and how objectivism, how objectivism views that? Well, I think in a way this is really something we were talking about a few minutes ago yeah. again. Yeah. Um, objective values that apply across the board for human beings are those things that are based on our need as human beings. And our opinions, our tastes, our backgrounds, they don't alter certain fundamentals. We need to reason, we need to produce, right? You need to put bread on the table, whether it's bread on the table or you know, financial analysis or philosophy teaching or being a nurse or whatever the work that you do to put bread on the table. And maybe you don't eat bread, maybe you're on a low carb diet. Okay, but you, you need nutrient, you, know, you get back to just these basics. And it's, if a human being wants to live, wants to survive, he's got to meet certain of these needs, including psychological needs including needs for companionship or for recreation or for art or for inspiration, for knowledge, right? We have a need to know things. So there are all sorts of objective values that are rooted in our nature. But at the same time, I see you've got some artwork up on the wall and we don't all have the same tastes in art, but there's a need, I mean, it's somewhat a tricky example. I think it's universal, even exactly, though we yeah, exactly. The need for art is universal, even though some people like this painter and some people like that sculpture or whatever it might be. Um, taste in movies, taste in you know, literature, and so on. Taste in other people. Taste in other yep. Yeah. Um, why do you think? Why is it so misunderstood? I mean, it. it and it. Why is the idea of selfishness so misunderstood? And it's. It's not just in the popular culture, but it seems to be misunderstood among thinkers, among philosophers, among people who kind of yeah. better. I have a few different things I want to say on this, because I've been thinking about this myself more so just in the last year, year and a half, because I've been talking about selfishness for a long time. And a lot of the talks that I give 
uh, not even so much here at UT in my teaching, but in a lot of the talks that I've given abroad in recent years or to other kinds of audiences, I'm often talking either very directly about selfishness or without in any veiled way, you know, other topics like happiness that bring in selfishness. And after a while, you try to understand more of the resistance. So I, I mean, a few thoughts, and I'd really be interested in what you have to say too on these, your own. Um, okay, the one might be the most obvious. When you, you know, when you or I say selfishness, that just loads in such awful connotations in, in, in most people's minds, right? They are thinking of the cheater, the scammer, the philanderer, the guy who never keeps his word, who's always looking for a shortcut. I mean, they have some image of one or more of these different, you know, be it the Bernie Madoff or the John Edwards, that presidential candidate who cheated on his sick wife, you know, like it's some version of all that. So it's like, what the hell are they talking about? Talking about, so yeah, she seems okay. She doesn't, you know, she Smith, the speaker doesn't seem like she'd rip off your wallet at lunch, but, but selfishness. So they have all these associations and when you attack altruism, you know, when you, when you try to talk in principle about the alternative, in effect, I think the reaction, at least subconsciously, is like, well, we're not talking about altruism. I'm not saying I want to be Mother Teresa or a martyr or, you know, a missionary and give up everything. You know, you just want to be a normal, balanced person, right? So I think the reaction comes from a resistance to seeing the alternatives in principle terms in stark terms, because people are pragmatic as thinkers. I mean, they've been trained, they've been educated to be very piecemeal, very patchwork. You know, they find a bug, they, they throw up a patch, right? A little of this, a little of that. Of course, you gotta be selfish sometimes. Oh, sure, of course, right? But not too much or in moderation. Um, so they have a very unprincipled perspective to begin with. They feel like they've seen selfish people and it's nasty, or perhaps they've been victimized by selfish people. In a related vein, I think we have such a crude vocabulary that we use when we denounce certain behavior or certain people. We just throw it all under, under the bus of at selfish. Yep. And so often when you really look at what the allegedly selfish person is, you know, the idea that it's really in his self-interest or even could have been thoughtfully conceived or expected to have been in his interest dissolves under like a few minutes of analysis, right? It's like, it's not, well, I mean, really treating other people like garbage, that's really, that's helping you. And I'm not just talking about, oh, you'll get a bad reputation, which people love to say or something like that. Really, you don't benefit from other people. You don't benefit, you don't enjoy and actually get something else out of certain different kinds of friendships and good relationships that you could have, or not even friendships, just, you know, sort of the strangers that you meet or the, you know, the people that you come into, you know, contact with, baristas, whatever it might be. I mean, so at any rate, my thought there was we throw under, you know, oh, it's selfish. No, it might be inconsiderate behavior. It might be an inappropriate elevating of your preferences over those of others, which sometimes that's inappropriate. And if you're doing that, that's not selfish, that's inconsiderate, that's being non-objective, right? So our vocabulary is really crude here too. But I've got a couple of other somewhat different thoughts about the resistance. I think it's really threatening to people when you preach selfishness. Yeah. Because they're invested in selflessness, right? That's what they've heard. And the part of them that wants to be a good person, and a lot of people, I think, you know, a lot of people, they basically, they wanna be a good person. You know, whatever their idea of what it is to be a good person, they wanna be a good person, right? And it's been drilled into them, maybe by mommy and daddy, you know, whatever the upbringing, but by the culture at large that, oh yeah, you know, the people who get the awards, they're the, selfless people or to put others first or to serve others, right? Service, you above me. And now you're saying it's good to be selfish. You're threatening their conceptions of themselves. You're threatening every, this is how we, they raise their children, right? Yep. And then there's some part of a lot of people that realizes, well, of course, yeah. I mean, even these professed 
selfless people, the people who would at least say it's an ideal, if you, even if they think they don't live up to it themselves, right? Some part of them knows they can't self design the system pays for it, right? They know they've got to cheat, but at least they feel guilty about it. Yep. And that's kind of like, it's almost like that helps them get away with it. But I have that, you know, I could pat myself on the back because I feel guilty. But yep. now that woman, that Smith, she said that Ayn Rand, they want to take my guilt away too. This is really threatening, right? And then the other thing is a line, I forget who said this, but it's a famous line, which I just happened to come across again a few days ago, but it, I think it's true very often. Well, yeah, it is true. You can't reason people out of something that they weren't reasoned into in the first place. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. isn't that good? Somebody yeah. famous said that, I have to look it up. That's a good and it's line. like, you know, if you don't believe in altruism or selflessness, because oh yeah, didn't you see? Didn't you get that argument? Didn't you, did you miss class that day? You know, this is really the reason. Yeah. It's an article of faith. It's yeah. so much an article of what we're supposed to think. Everybody else thinks it. Oh, everybody thinks it. How could you not think that, right? So it's really hard to reason out or to fully engage the reason of people not reason on another basis. What do you think about the idea that? it's threatening to them in another respect in the sense that it's demanding. Um, you know, being selfish is, oh, you mean, oh my God, I only have one life. That's right. I, I, I better get on with, you know, living. Yeah. And I haven't been. Yeah. And it, it's going to be hard work. And I'm going to have to, I mean, one of the things that is, is fun about objectivism, but also intimidating about objectivism is it's not just laid out there. There are no 10 commandments. Yeah. There's no... There's no, here's how, you know, you go to church on Sundays, you do these things, you do, right, right. Well, you have to figure stuff out. You have to figure yeah. out what you believe, what's true, what's not. Suddenly it's, it's, it's you. It really depends. Yeah, no, I think, I think that is part of what's threatening too. No, I think that's really true. There's a sense in which altruism or, yeah, I mean, altruism just, it's this nice default. Everybody else has figured it out, whatever society thinks. And what's good for society? And you get these answers. Maybe it's from Ten Commandments. Maybe it's just from conventional wisdom. But you know what everybody knows about how to serve others, what to do now that you've graduated and you're supposed to give back and all that. Um, yeah, no, it's a it's a big responsibility to really want something, right? To quote one of the novels. Um, yeah, you've got to figure out what you want to do with your life. It can't be, well, as long as I'm serving others or, oh, well, I'll do this thing that's socially respectable and it seems to serve, like, no, you've really got to think it through fully and on an ongoing basis, you know, when new questions arise and all. And then you've got to you know, do it, live it. Um, and it's not always the easiest there, but yeah. And you don't have model, you know, you don't have as many models as you should have. So it's like, gee, my mother didn't do that. My father didn't do that. My brother, my sister, you know, like, you know but it's, and, and it, in a way, a lot of what's, yeah, you've got to face your life is yours, but this is the only one you get. So and there are no easy outs. There's no, it's the genes, it's my environment, it's other people. I mean, it, it involves taking responsibility in the deepest sense completely, possible. Completely. Your own life and your own happiness. Yeah, yeah. No, and yeah. You know, one of the, the virtues that Ayn Rand talks about is independence. And I think that's closely related to what we often think of when we talk about being responsible. But there too, you know, so often when we, we, we praise a person for being responsible, what we mean is he's responsible to others. Yep. You know, if he gives you his word, he shows up or he does it. I mean, at least that's a lot of what people often mean. And that's a very good thing. But Equally important, more important is taking responsibility for your happiness, for figuring it out, and then for, you know, trying to take the kinds of actions to really make your life as good as it can be. Why do you think, I mean, I think all that makes sense for, you know, 99% of the people. What is going on with intellectuals who should know better, philosophers who, who supposedly calmly think about these issues and, and supposed to be objective about them. Why is it so hard for them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you wish you knew. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's some different answer from, from the ones I've just 
you know, given on these other things. I think there's just a lot of um, groupthink, yeah. conventional wisdom or conventional academic wisdom. So they have the same psychological issues. Or... I think so. Yeah, I think some of it is. I think the the threatened by the package deals too of oh no, if you say this about selfishness, then does that commit you to capitalism? Oh my God, now really, you know. Um, yeah. No, there. I mean, you know, we could talk about the animus toward Rand, which is specialized in a way, but um, I mean, to some extent too, I think. In some quarters, and this might be more the case in some areas of academia than others, like, you know, maybe more in philosophy than in economics or something like that. But also, you know, certainly with, within philosophy, it varies a great deal. Um, and now I lost my thought. What was I going to say? Um, completely lost it. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so why, so let's go back to, we talked about emotions, but let's go back to some of the kind of objections. So somebody's asking, you know, he gets a murder, salt is evil, and egoism because it's destructive to the assaulter. But I'm how sorry, to, it's, it's Oh, to the assaulter. To the yeah, assaulter. And, and the same with cheating. And, you know, I hear this all the time about lying. And, and you know, it's so often, it seems in my self-interest to lie or to, you know, sometimes it's a little thing or to cheat. So why can't I have that money? Um, yeah. Why would that hurt me? In what way would it hurt me? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, mm -hmm. What are these vices really vices? What is it about them that really hurts? Well, they, they don't, okay. Um, the vices don't work in principle because they're not fundamentally serving your genuine well-being, right? They might satisfy a momentary appetite the desire, right? So it's sort of like a version of the emotionalism that we talked about earlier, right? Well, I want it and I can get it and I can get away with it. But what more is there to consider? Well, the fact that the lifespan of a human being, you know, is usually X years, you know, this many decades and so on. And there are certain kinds of actions that are conducive to meeting the needs that, that you have on an ongoing basis um, and certain kinds of actions that aren't. So it's again, in part, a matter of realizing human beings, and you were saying before, you know, we were both saying you know, we're volitional, we make choices, you can't just say, oh no, it's the genes or something like that. So we need, we need to figure out the level at which to think about things such that we can make the kinds of individual cases on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis that, that are sustainable, that are a sustainable means of fulfilling our various needs. So yeah, you can lie or cheat in a given case and get away with it, but it doesn't mean that that's a policy, either the policy of being dishonest or do whatever you feel like it, that's sustainable. Right? I mean, one example I used to give years ago was, once in a while you can cross a busy city street without looking and get away with it. You can get to the other side. It doesn't mean, oh, I don't need to look at the, you know, I don't need to look for, for cars or trucks or anything like that. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? So the fact that you could get away with it doesn't mean that faking things is a good policy. And this is what I really like, one of the things you know, that's so true and somewhat unusual about Ayn Rand's analysis of the virtue of honesty. She doesn't defend it because it'll help your relations with other people. Like, oh, they'll like you, they'll reciprocate, you can have trust and so on. Even though some of that is true and important and valuable, right? For more basic reason, or espousing honesty is when you pretend that things are other are other than they are, they're still what they are. Faking things doesn't change them. Yep. Pretending that you have credentials for a job or experience for a job doesn't give you that experience and the relevant know-how and all of that. And so and so, yeah, you might fool this person now, but you're not going to be able to fool anybody or fool reality. Yep. Good. So when we talk about self-interest, we, we almost always talk about long-term self-interest to differentiate it from this kind of um, momentary. But there's also a sense in which you want to live the present. You want to live the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. how, do one, how does one balance or is there even a contradiction or is there a conflict between living the present and thinking and planning long-term? 
I'm not I'm not sure what to say here. Like I, I don't think it's a conflict exactly, but maybe this is just a fudge on my part to say maybe there's a tension. I mean, there certainly is. You can't put all your well, you know, some variation of don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't want to put all your thought and satisfaction in life into the future or the long range because I could be dead. I could be hit by that truck, you know, and that's very real, right? That's very real. So there is, and I'm not sure if balance is the best word, but for want of a better word right now, right? There is a, a, a very real sense in which you have to keep your eye on the near term and the far term, or the long term and the overall. And I also think that when we talk and talking about selfishness of the long term, what we really usually mean is not just you know, time, future, down the road, but what we really mean is you need to think about the full 360 of your interest, all dimensions, you know, the, the depth, the width, the, you know, the breadth of what's really in your interest overall. But again, on the long term versus short term, you have to cash in sometimes, so to speak. Again, just to put it in these terms, you can't you know, be so preoccupied with saving money for when you retire that you don't enjoy life today or you de deny yourself certain pleasures that would really enhance what you have now. Now, again, you don't want to, again, I don't think I can say anything more than what's pretty obvious here about. You can't privilege one at the expense of the other because you have to understand the uncertainty of life. That is, it's not that, well, you know, you will live to be 94 and you will live to be 95. No, you don't know that. You can hope, you can do things to try to make that as likely as possible if that's really what you'd like. But, you, but you've also got, I mean, you're always looking for a certain quality of life. Whether you're thinking about how do I want to retire or what do I want in my 40s or in my 30s or in my, right? What do I want in this five-year period? It's always, you know, well, a certain quality of life. And, you, and that may change even tastes or what is satisfying to you. You might find, oh, it's a little different now than it was 10 years ago in these respects. So I should make some adjustments in how I'm doing things, whether it be spending resources or, yeah, well, yeah, spending resources in general in terms of time as well as money. And things. So I just got a note here from uh, Emmanuel who says he just want to send you a note that your mm -hmm. work had a deep impact on his life and he just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank so. you very, very much. I really, I really appreciate that, Manuel. Thank you. Uh, so Ryan's asking a question back to the kind of the, why can't you get away with murder? And he's asking, is it also true that it's bad because or it's evil because it actually hurts others. It, it's, it's harming other people and it's violating their rights and their humanity. Um, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, each man is an end in himself. And to be objective, you have to respect that fact and treat people accordingly. So, I mean, morally and sort of in terms of political rights and so on. Yeah, it's an abomination. It's a, it's a, you're, you're, you're certainly right. It's a, a complete violation of this other person's rights. It's a complete violation and denial of this other person's humanity and that his life is his every much, every bit as much as mine is mine. So yeah, and it's bad for you as well. But I mean, even when we're not talking about murdering, a person, you know, just lying or, cheating a person you're like oh no i'm going to deliberately take some of his money oh that's his and i mean you know principles of what's mine and nine these are again at the core of objectivist uh, morality these social principles of rights and so on yeah and and, and, and you're rejecting the the basis by which you are more you're rejecting the universality of the principles yeah yeah right this kind of pick and choose or if i can get away it's like no no the idea of these principles is they apply for everyone, you know, to everyone and in our interactions with everyone. And in a way, too, this reminds me of the virtue of justice, which is a really big virtue in objectivism. And people often think, uh, you know, you got to be just, but man, if you could get away with it, really be in your interest to be unjust, you know, to not treat people as they deserve. And here again, Ayn Rand's insight is. No, no, it's really in your interest to be just, to treat other people as they deserve. 
because just as we were talking about, about like, I mean, there's a kind of parallel with honesty. A few minutes ago, I was saying, look, baking things doesn't change them. The same applies when you're assessing other people, other human beings, right? I can fake his character. I can pretend that he's better than he is, but it doesn't make him any better than he is. Or similarly, I can pretend that somebody's worse than he is. That doesn't make him worse. Than he is. So, you know, there's, at any rate, bringing this back to the kind of question that was just asked, um, justice is a matter of, you know, judging people objectively, treating them as they deserve. There's no reason why this person deserves to be shortchanged by you in, in any of the kind of ways. So, so let's talk. Let's talk about justice. It's a it's an important virtue, and it's it's one that I think sometimes doesn't get discussed as much in objectivism. So what's the essential characteristic of justice? Judging people objectively, treating them accordingly. I mean, that's really at the heart of what justice is, right? And in a sense, I mean, justice is one of those virtues that everybody loves, in theory at least, right? But I mean, all sorts of different religious traditions, secular traditions, East, West, around the world, age old, they've all, espoused some version of justice and largely ones that talk about this idea of desert, right? Um, to be just, you have to, uh, you know, it's important to get all the elements of it here. It involves judging people. Now we can come back to that because that's not fashionable to judge people, right? But it involves judging, evaluating. Judging objectively, Ayn Rand emphasizes, right? Not hastily or sloppily or casually or um, prematurely or anything. It's like, no, you have to judge objectively. You have to be damn careful to get all the evidence and get all the facts and suspend judgment when you don't have them, right? But you have to judge objectively and then you have to act accordingly, right? You go, oh, well, I judge you such and such, but who cares about that? No, thoughts are for action to inform our action. If I realize on an objective evaluation of you, you're not trustworthy. And it would be idiotic for me to continue to deal with you as if you were. You know, and you can think of all sorts of variations of that, but that's the essence of it. Now we can elaborate in different directions and exactly what I'm judging about a person will depend on the circumstance. Am I judging him as a, a tutor in some subject that I'm not doing too well in? Am I judging him as a financial analyst, as a potential pediatrician or what? You know, pay attention to different kinds of things depending Sure. So, so, so why is this, why is it, why do we live in a culture where judging is looked down upon? It, it, it's, it's, it's not popular. You're not supposed to judge. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think there's some, you know, I think there's some emotionalism involved or wishful thinking or, oh, well, I don't want to be judged. I mean, there's a certain kind of, well, if we don't judge each other and if we tell each other we're not supposed to judge, then I don't have to judge myself or be as good as I should be, right? It's like, no, you should make your person, yourself, the best goddamn person you can be. You, you should have nothing to be afraid of being judged about, right? And it's not about how other people see you, right? But if you live your life honestly and objectively and so on, you have, you have nothing to worry about, whatever other people think of you, right? But the reason to judge others is selfish, self-defense. Other people can affect your values, the things that you care about. I mean, I think this is the case for justice, right? They might be trying to affect you, they might not be. They can affect you in small ways or, or big ways. But the point is, our values, everything we really care about in life, the big things, the little things, it's all susceptible to the influence of others, the limited influence, the big influence. Therefore, if you care about your values, you got to look after them, right? Um, so it makes sense to judge this person who's now going to be the pediatrician or the babysitter or the nanny or whatever, right? I better judge this person if I'm going to invest a lot of money with him or if I'm going to take him on as a roommate or take a ride, you know, cross country with, right? I have reason to care, so I have reason to judge. But oh, who's to judge? I mean, they play, you know, the, the usual ethos of nobody should be judgmental, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. 
look, when I make a judgment, I'm not saying I've never made any mistakes, either mistakes in my own life or mistakes in judgment. I'm just saying this is what the evidence right now is showing. If I've made a mistake, show me what's wrong with what I'm doing, right? But you have to go by your best, honest, objective judgment about any issue at any point in time. And that includes other people, yep. right? And you can be careful about, again, you have to judge objectively. You can't judge a person on scores about which you don't know anything, right? I don't know what he's like as a, as a husband, but I know what he's like as a doctor. Or I know what he's like as a this or that. And you can constrain your judgments accordingly. But here again, you know, you say judge and people load in all these connotations of, oh, you're a dogmatist or, oh, you think you're infallible and you never make a mistake or blah, blah, blah. You know? But it's this ethos of egalitarianism. Oh, aren't we all really the same? No. And everybody knows that, you know, why do you go to that restaurant? Because they serve good food or clean food, whatever the hell it might be, right? Oh my God, you're going to get me going again in emotion. Yeah, no, go, go for it. And, and it's, it's related to altruism, right? It has to be in some way related to not being selfish. Not no, Don't pursue your, <laughs> don't be careful about your values. Just give it all up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's the big deal of, you know, and we don't teach, we don't pe teach people to take care of themselves. And judging is such an important part of taking care of themselves. Yeah, it's crucial. And I really like just your, what's the big deal? Yeah. Life's a big deal. Yeah. Your life is a big deal. And if you're not serious about that, then hang up now or what, you know, like, then don't listen, right? I mean, part of, and this maybe even goes back to the conversation a little earlier and about academics, take ideas seriously. If you take ideas seriously, if you take your life seriously, you'll take ideas seriously and you'll take big ideas seriously and you'll be honest about it. Yeah. Which includes periods or pockets in which it's like, oh my God, I'm really confused right now. Yeah. Right? But if you take, and again, I think this might even trigger what I had forgotten a while ago that you know, there are some in certain spheres of academia for whom ideas are a game. Not saying they're all like that, but I mean, for whom ideas are just this artificial play and isn't it? No wonder they just want to relegate selfishness or justice or objectivism to these certain, you know, not to be dealt with seri seriously. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you said it earlier. I think a big part of this is to judge other people requires you to judge yourself. And it, it goes back to that personal responsibility. It goes back to taking responsibility over your life and judging yourself. And I think people are afraid of that. And being it, rational, you know, being rational about everything. Well, this is what I'm saying. Oh, maybe I misunderstood. And you find out that you did misunderstand somebody yeah. and you misjudge them for better or worse. Yeah. yeah. Let me also say, while we're on this subject of justice, um, you know, Ayn Rand's thrust in talking about justice is not a waving, scolding finger. Go out there and accuse everybody of everything. It's like, no. Yeah. Again, the reason to be just is to protect the things you care about, to advance the things you care about. But my favorite part of justice is praising the good. Yep. There is so much good. And again, sometimes it's little good things that people do well, but there's so many good things that so many people do. And it's such a joy and such fun to underscore those things, right? Yes. To say the little thing to somebody or to send the little note like, man, that was really good the way you did that. That was, you know, that was better than these other things. So like with these other people, I mean, you don't have to make it always comparison with other people, but um, salute the good, praise it. You know, we talked earlier about you, you can get on a losing streak and you can get discouraged and that's so natural for everybody. And we also know how heartening it can be just to get that little pat on the back sometimes or that little nod of encouragement. It's, you know, so thank you, Manuel, again, um, for your, what you said earlier. But um, I love writing, I'm a big fan of fan letters. I, like often there's an author or somebody I'll like, and I'll just write them a few lines. It also gets you to live in that positive universe a little bit longer. It often, when you go to praise something or someone, it often leads you to identify even more specifically than you had exactly what it was that you liked about that book that you read by that guy or, and so on. So it's a real, I don't know, pleasure enhancer, pleasure. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna ask you, what's the selfish motivation to, to, to praise the good and to be just 
towards the good. And part of it is that- I want more, man. Yeah. You want to keep, you keep writing those things. I mean, yeah. that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and you want to you wanna be supportive of good people because good people enhance your life and you want them exactly. to enhance you it wanna more. You want to contribute to the pool of good people doing good things, things that you think are good. You want to say, yeah, because also, especially when I talk about things like writing fan letters to authors, for instance. Yes. You don't, if, as an author, I can say, and you, you've been in the same, right? And as a, as a doing what you do on the podcast, you don't know who's out there listening. You don't know what they're getting out of it. And sometimes it's really hard to make your own decisions about what to do as to what's going to get across, what's going to be clear, what's going to be effective or persuasive or not. And you genuinely, you're not omniscient. You don't know. So it's really helpful to get some feedback from people, pro or con. You know, like the criticisms can be helpful too. But um, so we all know that feedback can be helpful, again, not just spiritually in terms of inspirationally, but helping us think, yeah, this is on the right course. Maybe this wasn't so much on the right course. And, but right, what you want selfishly is to be contributing to this pool of good people creating good stuff from which we all And And yeah, and as, as somebody who, <laughs> you know, podcasts and things like that, you get a lot of the negative, right? So, so the criticisms, because people are very quick to do that. They're very quick, particularly objectivists. They're very quick to tell you when you're wrong. They're very quick to tell you when you make a mistake or when they mm -hmm. think you make mistake mm -hmm. and they're very quick to write you off mm -hmm. so it's 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 actually there's a there's a lack of this seems to be a lack of balance in terms of the a lack of the positive trait unfortunately within kind of the objectives community it's yeah and i think sometimes too that that can be related to context dropping um in terms of forgetting the value of something and just harping on the negative when there are when you can find faults but, um, but again, my more general thrust is just, man, be looking for the, I mean, be objective about everything and everybody you're judging in whatever realm, but be looking for the positive and saluting it more is just a pleasure, I find. I, mean, I find it a tremendous pleasure. So maybe this is me indulging in a uh, certain emotion that I know that I like, but I think it's, I think, I think it's a win-win when you sort of salute the positive and try to identify what is the positive yeah, you, you're losing you a little bit, so oh, I don't sorry. know. Mike has moved a little bit. My Meyer, my Mike. How's that? Any better? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think people associate justice too much with criminal justice or the legal system, and not enough with this idea of of positive reinforcement and and positive values and recognizing mm -hmm. the positive. Uh, and at the mm -hmm. end of the day. For the most part in life, you get more from the people who, who are creating positive values than you have to, than you, you than, than the people who are bad or, or you know, are threatening. Oh, for the most, for sure. I mean, apart from the very, the exceedingly rare, egregious cases of yeah. having, you know, an evil person in your life, a really toxic and destructive person, we do get some, I mean, the good we get is. This is a pretty good deal. This was a yeah. good thing. We get a lot of it. Yeah. So let's connect all this to happiness. So why should I be selfish to be happy? In what sense is being just? Is 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 uh, is is living a just life necessary for being happy? Uh, I guess I want to be almost sarcastic here and say, well, you just go try not being selfish and being happy. Good luck with that. I mean, you know, let's just think again at, at very basic levels of what we mean by happiness, what we mean by selfishness. Selfishness, I was saying earlier, I think. Um, you know, you're trying to make your life the best it can be. I mean, we've just passed the new year, a time when people make New Year's resolutions and they think about self-improvement and all. And that's a good thing, right? And don't we know that that's a good thing, right? I mean, we might question some of the particulars of uh, what they want to reform in their lives or how they want to go about it, right? But the idea of you want to make the best of your next year, right? That's a really good thing so that you, you can be happy, so that you can be happier, right? So that you can live a more selfish, self-interested life. Again, not at the expense of others. It's not zero sum. I mean, that's something we haven't talked about too much, but you know, the, 
the kind of selfishness Ayn Rand is endorsing is not good for me at the expense of you or other people. No, it's better I can be, the more I can bring to the table for everybody else too, but that's not why I'm doing it. But this goes back to our point about how, you know, life is win-win. Um, so at any rate, happiness is a matter of achieving your values. Now that means you have to choose carefully again what your values are. You have to really think about, you have to take that responsibility for thinking what is going to put together the best kind of life for me, the ideal life. And then what do I need to do to do that? But Rand spoke of happiness as the state of awareness, the kind of satisfaction that comes from the achievement of your value. And here again, I read something the other day. Somebody put it something like this, I'm paraphrasing. When you're happy, you have what you want, but you've chosen good things to want. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, and the two parts are, in, are, are both important. So, um, does that mean that you have to be an objectivist to be happy? That's a good one. Um, yes and no, if I can say that. Um, it's going to be very hard to be happy, fully happy, with values, you know, things that you want, things that you seek, things that you treat as good that are antithetical to your nature, to your genuine well-being. Right? There's a limited way in which getting something that you want feels good, even when what you want is not really good. And you can, you know, you can kind of lie to yourself over time or build up blind defenders of a certain vision of life that makes you think even oh, no, I'm leading a good life because I'm leading it by these non-objective, non-selfish lights or values and so on. But you're not going to be able to, without, without frustration, without inklings of this isn't quite right, this, right? I mean, what we do carries emotional repercussions. And when we're doing things that are not actually in our interest, it's it's going to take a toll. It's going to take a toll on us in all, you know, in all ways, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. Um, I mean, think about some of the cases that we all know of people who are unhappy, who have in many ways, you would look at them and think, my God, you know, she's okay. She's well off. She's comfortable. You know, she's got this kind of family or that kind of money or income or whatever and so on. And you can see or know, sometimes they themselves are even quite aware of, but I'm not happy, you know, but I'm not satisfied, or this isn't giving me what I think it should. And typically that comes from they're not being in touch with what they really value, what's really gonna be selfishly best for them in terms of the kind of, the kind of work they're doing, the kind of relationship they're in and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think people are going to be happy to the extent that they are rational, to the extent that they are selfish. Um, and, and people who, even who don't accept the morality of selfishness often behave in selfish ways because... I mean, they well, they, they have to cheat on that. Yeah, I mean, you can't be... You certainly, you certainly can't be a perfect altruist and perfectly happy. Yes, that's impossible. You're not alive, probably. Right. You're a perfect altruist. Yeah, so you certainly can't be happy. Yeah, um, and I mean, you have to be honest about what's really going on for you psychologically. You know, you have to pay attention to all the evidence that you're getting of what's working, what's not. And oh yeah, wasn't I a good boy? Pat myself on the on the back. I did the the right thing by all the societal conventional standards, by all the things that I've absorbed as the right standards. But why does this not feel quite as full as it should. Why am I still thinking, maybe I really should have done that other thing that I wanted to do that I thought would be better for me. And so those are naturally gonna be there. Yeah. Somebody's asking if you, if you can give a real example of altruism being bad. Sure, now I have in mind just a simple example, like there's no reason to put somebody else, you know, just some anonymous other person's well-being above your own. Now, I'm not talking about 
certain kinds of relationships that we have with certain other people, you know, good or close friends or the one or two or three people in our lives we love you know, the most. I'm not talking about that kind of thing, right? Because yeah. there's all sorts of things that you can do for that kind of person, you know, in those sorts of relationships that it is selfish for you to do. It's not altruist for you to do, right? But the altruist, you know, the kind of mantra, okay, now that you've graduated, you know, at commencement at colleges every spring, now it's your turn to give back to serve something larger than yourself. So join the, I mean, if you join the military because you want to serve, that's not in your interest. That's bad, right? If you join the Peace Corps, you join Teach for America because you want to serve, not because you think, yeah, this is the thing I'll most enjoy doing. This is the thing that I'll find most rewarding. It's productive work that I think I can grow in and take real satisfaction from. No, nah, it's not really what I want to do. By those terms, want to do it, right? By rational, considered self-interest terms. I don't want to go into the family business, but that's what I'm supposed to do. And I'm supposed to be a good altruist. No, that's not good. That's not good for anybody. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the best example of that is is in the Fountainhead with Peter Keating, who who becomes an architect, not because he loves it, not because he cares about it, but because his mother wants him to. And he does it to appease her. And mm -hmm. later in life, when he recognizes it, and he always wanted to be a painter and never was, mm -hmm. it's too late. His life is over. Right. Oh, and it's a tragic case. It's, yeah. it's, oh, the example there is so poignant of this person who never developed his own soul. And it's, it's, but it's still there for him, right? He still wants to be the painter, right? It's still there. It didn't go away because he tried to convince himself that what mattered was pleasing his mother, and then, well, pleasing Ellsworth Tui and pleasing everybody in society. Yeah, and this is part of the sense in which you got one life, and you don't get any of it back. You, you, you can't waste a minute because the minute is gone. It's, it's never yeah. happening again, yeah. and, and uh, Rand Conk, yeah. that's so no, I mean, you have to, obviously, in certain periods of your life, you're trying to figure it out, you know, and there may be periods of uncertainty where it's, you know, don't waste any minute of your life doesn't mean don't do the reflecting that you might need to do. It's like, maybe I need a few weeks to really think about this. Maybe I need, you know, maybe I need to start thinking about leaving this job, but that's obviously a big decision. It's not, well, make a decision because time is, you know, there are decisions, there are periods, there are adjustments you might need to make to different life changes and life circumstances that are going to take time. And you have to be honest with yourself about that, but be taking the, you know, be using the time to make the decisions, to best position yourself for leading your, your one life. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, it's related and unrelated. Do psychopaths really exist in a sense that can you really go through life harming others and feel no guilt or unease whatsoever? I guess so, but I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, I mean that's. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that there are such truly warped, and I mean here now, like literally physiologically warped human beings. You know, physi physiologically, there's something going on haywire, such that I think that that can be a real phenomenon. But I'm not an expert on that, so I'm sorry, person. And and it doesn't matter because even if they are, you you don't you don't. You don't come up with a morality for oh, course. no, they're the I mean to say outliers, the, right. I mean they're not it's like, yeah, there are there are freak cases in any species, right? But you don't figure out what's best, what's healthy for the, for the species, right, but on the basis of the well, yeah. So it's um You've been give, you've you've given talks on happiness and on selfishness for many years to, to college students. You know, do you see an impact? Do you see a response? Do you see, you know, kind of positive feedback that? Actually, yes. You know, and I referred earlier to, oh, why the resistance and so on. But, um, I, I, yeah, no, I have to say, I have seen a fair amount of positive response. Now, by that, you know, I don't mean, oh, the scales fall from their eyes and they all, you know, go to Amazon that night and buy all the Ayn Rand they can buy or anything, you know. But I do think people often, you know, 
a lot of the kinds of people I've spoken to, be they college students, be they older people, because I've frequently spoken for different kinds of audiences. Um, they do see a lot of sense, I think, in what we're saying, particularly about selfishness. Yeah. And just to begin to discredit some of the associations that they have, um, I've gotten some very good response on that. Now, at the same time, you wonder, at least from certain quarters, how long that response lasts or how deep it is, right? But what's really nice, what's really nice is occasionally you will hear from someone who might have heard you or read something of yours you know, like last year or five years ago. I mean, and that's real. I mean, that's when it's like, oh, I guess that that did make a difference, at least with that person. It was of some help and usefulness. And that's that's wonderful. But but again, I think if you're in 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 giving talks, if you try to give a lot of examples, you can give people at least pieces that they can, you know, deeply entrenched as we are in our society in these altruist ideas. Again, everybody knows they have to be selfish to some extent. It's the dirty secret that they don't want to talk about. So showing them part of why that makes sense, why that's nothing to apologize for, it doesn't mean that they're, they're going to come out of that talk saying there's nothing to apologize. But, but the more you can plant doubts, and give people something to think more about. And I, I, I think I've been effective at, at some of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and it, I mean, and heaven knows you've been your own with, I think, a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, you, you don't know for how long, and, and, but you, there are examples, there are occasions where people say, yes, it's really changed my life. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Just later. Yeah. Um, but it takes work. And this is this is where the challenge is, right? They walk out of a lecture and they think, oh, this is great. I got it. But then to implement it, to actually act on it, being mm -hmm. selfish is mm -hmm. work. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it's fun work. I mean, it's great work because it's, hey, it's all for me, right? It's coming from, I'm going to make my, I mean, this is fun. I don't want to get to do today. So how am I going to make it as good as it can be such that, it, you know, you get the fun out of it. Yeah, I mean. What, what can be a better challenge in life than to figure out how to live the best life possible? <laughs> That's what I don't get. Why no, Why everybody doesn't get this. This is easy. <laughs> this is good. No, it's, yeah. I know it's hard, but it's easy. It's also like, hey, it's hard. It's, and it, it's, a, it's like, yeah. It's work. And, and, and I, I don't it's think. It's effortful. It, yeah. Yeah. But work is good. I mean, work is not a big. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. definitely, uh, definitely. A, a, a positive. So what do you, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're working on these days. Well, you know, for the last several years, I've been doing a lot in philosophy of law yep. and that's sort of coming to a close. Now, uh, I'm still teaching a lot of philosophy of law and I love it. And I'm still doing some lecturing on it, mostly first amendment issues, freedom of speech, intellectual freedom more broadly. And you know, a couple of weeks classes are starting here. I'm teaching a philosophy of law class and a freedom of speech class. Okay. And, you know, speaking out of some, so I love that stuff, but I'm not going to be doing as much research in that area for the immediate future. I'm getting back to ethics, which I've have, even though we've been talking tonight about uh, happiness and justice and selfishness in my research and writing, I haven't been doing as much of that for 10 and 12 years. I want to get back to actually some of the psychological ends of living egoistically. So some of these questions about the role of pleasure, the role of emotion, the role of desire. Um, how certain subconscious tendencies that people have can get in the way of their living morally, even living egoistically, if they mean to live egoistically, some of that kind of thing I want to explore. So I'm just starting there, but talking about things like self-esteem as well. A lot of, so the intersection of psychological and moral issues, or you might say the psychoepistemology of egoism. Something like that, roughly. Great. I mean, Ayn Rand in her writings, I am always amazed at how psychological she was. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's because she was an right, she was a novelist. First. Right. Yeah. And to be a novelist, yeah. you have to understand how people think, how people feel, how people act and behave. And yeah. you have to yeah. know psychology implicitly. But she was like a pro at that. I mean, right, a good writer really has good realistic characters. But she had it in then some, like, you know, I mean, the psychological insights are tremendous, I think. And you get, 
you know, the more times you read certain things, the fiction as well as the nonfiction, the more you get how psychologically penetrated she was. But I think that's a lot of the power of the objectivist ethics that it's realistic to our psychologies. Yeah. And that's some of the territory I want to explore more with some people like, you know, Gina Gorlin, who's working on self-esteem issues as a psychologist and certain others in, in philosophy who are working on moral issues. So, good ter- sounds- again, talk about fun, pr- it's yeah. work, but oh my God, it's so much fun. And it's such selfish fun because I learn more about myself as well as I think ways that I can help you know, other people with more effectively selfish. So tell us about some of the books you've written so that people can go and get them, uh, particularly the one related to to this topic. We love love a chance for a plug. Um, Yeah, the one most related to this topic, actually, I think is one of my better books, um, Ayn Rand's Normative Ethics, The Virtuous Egoist. So my idea in that book and what I did is essentially I've got individual chapters on each of the major virtues according to Ayn Rand. So again, earlier when I was talking about reason, honesty, justice, productiveness, pride, et cetera, um, she had obviously spoken of those. She had written of them somewhat in the objectivist ethics and called speech and so on. Dr. Peacock in OPAR, Objectivism and the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, he had you know, several pages of discussion of each of the virtues. This book that I wrote a few years ago, um, gives you a full chapter analyzing each of the major virtues. I also take up a few conventional virtues, things that people normally regard as virtues, like generosity or kindness or one or two others, to assess, so where do they fit in for an objectivist ethics? Where does friendship fit in? So that book, I, I, I think that is a good book. I think it's pretty accessible. It's less meaning accessible to a person who's not a philosopher. Um, so again, that's Ayn Rand's Normative Ethics, The Virtuous Egoist. Then I had some, uh, you know, one of my prior books was on the foundations of ethics more. So the kinds of questions of well, how do you get objective value? It's a little bit more academic, you might say, but that's called Viable Values. And there's some, uh, some of the material in there I think is very useful for objectivists thinking about, well, are we talking about survival? Are we talking about flourishing? I think I have a good treatment of that question in there. Then I have a book on rights, more political. My very first book was on rights inflation, you might say, the inflation of people's claiming rights and how that cheapens the currency. Um, And then my most recent book, so jumping ahead then, was a book in philosophy of law on judicial review on how judges interpret the law. And I talk about some of the competing theories of originalism and living constitutionalism and minimalism and a plague on all their houses. I say the objective view is not the same as the originalist view and so on. So if you're inclined toward that sort of issue, that's- It's it's funny how in the world out there in conventional thinking, there always seems to be always two alternatives to think you know and 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 objectivism is is somehow in a in a in a third dimension it's a it's yeah. a you've got the you know the the subjectivist intrinsicist you've got but but also when you talked about egoism there was the the uh, you either uh, an sob or you're an altruist and right you know, you conceive of this third right. alternative and Ayn Rand, a lot of what she does is conceive of third alternatives that are new ways that are actually is, the actual, yeah, yeah. No, and I th- I'm, in terms of twos. Yeah. And then think of this third. Yeah. But I'm glad you brought it back to the selfishness discussion because, again, right, it's like they don't see the alternative in principle terms. So they don't see it as, well, we're not altruists. No, we're middle of the rotors, we're patchwork, and so on. But no, Rand's saying there's a fourth old. It's not, well, you could either be Mother Teresa and a martyr or Peter Singer, right, this complete sacrificer or a complete bastard, you know, just a selfish SOB, right? or you can be the middle of the rotor, you can be a principled yeah. egoist. You can be a rational, thoughtful egoist. Being considerate of other people is not antithetical to being an egoist, but what we need is that fundamental level of thought that'll bring us to the principles that are sustainable such that we can really achieve mutually compatible self-interests. 
Well, this has been great. I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to your to the new work you're doing on uh, for selfish reasons. I, mm, I, can, good, good. I want I want to know more about the intersection between uh, morality and, and psychology. I think it's yeah, me too. So it's going to take me a while because it is a, it's a because I mean this is a young philosophy and there's still a lot we have to learn and a lot Ayn Rand didn't write about that, right. that in terms of the technology of living, actually figuring out how to live and how to do a how to live a good life. Um, so but she gave us so many, I mean, man, the fundamentals that she laid down. It's like, wow, bad for your bed. Oh boy. Yeah, I mean, each essay. That's, that's like I'm jumping on the bed like a little kid jumping on the mattress. This is such fun. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. So those of you who have not read Ayn Rand, go read Ayn Rand. Those of you who have read Ayn Rand, go read Tara Smith. And um, thanks, thanks for being on the good. show. Thanks a lot for having me. This was fun. Uh, Absolutely. Talk Thank to you. Soon. Bye, Tara. Good night.